generally, I, 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 I know that folks want to keep talking to their lawyers and look at it. But the idea here, um, and for you to see Senator Benning, um, Senator Lyons. Good morning, Senator White. Oh, hello. Just sit here, Tucker. <laughs> I'm leaving. Hi, Jeanette. You look different today. <laughs> so, Mr. Chair, this is something of a uh, very minor cleanup on a small yep. provision in the bill. The, the large construct of the big change in the bill about changing liability standards, Senator Lyons, is, you know, seems fine. Um, Vermont Association for Justice was looking at all this to just make sure there wasn't any real limitation of liability from common malpractice law, because as we know from years of big work in here, the Sorry Works legislation, the mediation, medical malpractice issues are at this point generally kind of left to where they are. And so our intention was just to review this and, and make sure it was kind of a really targeted piece of special language in the tort environment, which this is now, with the addition that in good faith the uh, boosters of the bill put together last night, and that's appreciated. The addition of the last clause provided, however, this does not otherwise limit the liability of a participating physician. You now remembering that you hang a lot of consumer protection on this supervision plan, and it's a big change to kind of free and give more room for physician assistance. And so um, the backstory on the intensity around signing that form sounds interesting and, and something to assuage, and this little addition saying the bill does not otherwise cloud the tort environment on malpractice um, really sharpens the focus of that special language. It meets the goals of the Health and Welfare Committee, but doesn't interfere with current medical malpractice. That's our sense. We'll, we'll look at it. We'll, I'll... Okay. But well, I'm glad I'm to, sure you know, actually probably the Jen to, Eric. or Eric to draft it. As Can you draft it from, from Lyons and Sears? Lyons and Sears. Sure. And, and you'll present it on the floor for, based on you the work. There. Yeah. I'll get Joe. Was Senator Benny. <laughs> What is the status of it? Is it on the, it's not on the floor today. It's on the floor. It's, it's a, a, we'd be second passing over. Second reading today. Second reading. Yeah, second reading. This would be a, an amendment after oh. second reading, yeah. I guess. Or, yeah. So, yeah, it would be on the floor at 1 o'clock today. I jokingly said if I'm there, I've got people coming up from Bennington that I'm supposed to meet with. I'll be up there by 1.15 or so. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay. Thank okay. You. Everybody okay? Yep. All the parties? <coughs> Good. Thank you. Anybody else who wants to be on it is obviously welcome. Senator Benning, Senator White. I mean, I'll give it to the car. He's the defense attorney. I mean, I'll leave it for the other people. I don't know enough about this. Go around with my head. Yeah, otherwise, no, it doesn't mean that you can go after both of them at the same time, regardless. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I'll ask well, you. Well, you probably question. could anyway. Well, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. not the, you can go after anybody you want. Case in the hospital that it has their malpractice no, anyway. We're not, no, we're with the hospital. I, 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 you know, I, I had to draft the amendment in, like this morning because I didn't realize that no one had drafted it up. And I just yes. wanted to point yeah, out to the community the only change from the existing bill is adding the term, yeah. provided, however, this does not otherwise limit the liability of the participating physician. Mm -hmm. The rest of this, and I, it, it isn't clear the way I that it was drafted, the rest of this is in the bill as it passed right. the Senate Health right. and Welfare. That's just the, that's just the addition. Right. It's that just that last provide. sentence that was added, and I, I, it, and that doesn't indicate that, and I apologize for that. It's just, we we just have, have to have it. I get it. Thank you. Eric, are you free sometime? Sounds pretty clear to me. Eric, are you free sometime this morning? I'm not. I'm oh. books all for the entire morning. Okay. Right. My, my, I guess my question, of Eric, can I ask him a question? Sure. Um, so that phrase provided, however, it's not otherwise limit the liability of the participating physician. Does, does that imply that regardless of, uh, the physician assistant did something egregious, and it's not, and it was the physician's decision, decision to do it. Does that mean you can still go after the 
or three, the other position? Uh, the participating position for the same thing? I think that whatever the underlying lies on the ability of the physician to be a defendant in a situation like that is not altered by this. I think that's the intent of that. So okay. if under the underlying law they could not, then they still couldn't. That under the underlying law there might be a theory that they could bring in the, the physician, then they still could. But Un the underlying not law related to physician assistance or underlying law related to liability? The latter. The underlying okay. common law of medical malpractice. Okay. So that, I think, if I'm reading it right, the intent is to leave that unchanged. Okay. Other than the, point, the, the sort of one little layer on top of that, which is that you cannot bring in the position as a defendant based on the existence of this practice agreement alone. Okay. That, that, that okay. one particular fact would So, I mean, if the physician assistant went outside of the scope of practice indicated in the, physician, in the agreement, you cannot hold the practicing physician liable. I think that's right. Generally speaking, under the yeah. doctrine when you can hold an employer liable, if right. you act outside the scope, it's always the, it's uh, always the test, whether it's within the scope or outside the scope of employment. All other things being equal, that there's a phone for somebody to call to the other position and all the other stuff. Right. Okay. All right. I'm going to take this. I'm going to take this. Cool. That'll be good. Thank you. So I'll draft this up as a floor amendment for you, too. Present on the floor. That's the plan. Yeah. 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 From Sears. Yeah. Right. Nope. Okay. Thank you. L square S. Thank you all. Thank you. Pleasure Thank you. to have you here. Thank you. You've got um, an amendment that everybody has in front of them, I believe that you and the state's attorneys worked on? Yes, sir. And um, we have witnesses scheduled who could then comment on that. James is on the way. Huh? Pepper's on the way. Good. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So we have, we have really gutted this bill in terms of any additional holding. You know, which the original is. Three years old Correct. Uh, for the record, Morning Fox, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Mental Health. Uh, I'd like to start by saying you know, thank you to the committee and to the chair. Uh, I want to repeat what I've said at the beginning of almost each and every testimony around this bill, uh, which has been to say thank you for introducing this bill. Uh, this is a discussion that has been uh, long needed, uh, and it's been my pleasure to be a part of this, this conversation uh, and getting this bill to the point where it is now. Uh, uh, as uh, the chair mentioned, uh, we've had conversations with uh, state's attorneys as well as alleged counsel uh, in trying to provide some uh, further input on uh, the language. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Eric. Uh, your work on this has been uh, tremendous, and thank you for your patience uh, as we've been working around numerous uh, illnesses in our department trying to uh, come up with the language and finally get it to you. And, uh, get it in, in front of the committee for today's uh, testimony. Um, interestingly enough, um, the language in here, uh, I can kind of go over again if that would be helpful for the yeah. committee. Um, and so uh, some of the, the specific provisions that, that we had looked for uh, to have included in, uh, in this uh, bill just give me a second as I'm trying to reorient myself to this first time actually looking at it on paper. Um, but uh, uh, the basic tenets are of, of the different things that I testified to uh, last week uh, have all been incorporated into this version, uh, including uh, some of the following. Um, the uh, idea that uh, competency and sanity evaluations are now be separated, uh, that if there is a competency and sanity uh, question, that the competency evaluation uh, would take place uh, first, and that sanity evaluations uh, would only take place once uh, competency has been established or that the evaluator uh, feels that they ha can have a finding of uh, competence uh, to stand trial. Uh, 
and this would help, uh, I believe, with Vermont and becoming more in line with uh, uh, the best practices throughout throughout the nation um, uh, in regards to that. Um, this uh, this language also uh, includes. Uh, where am I going with this? Um, the uh, party status uh, that uh, the department had requested when competency and sanity uh, is requested uh, or that sanity and competency have been raised as an issue uh, that uh, the Department of Mental Health and the Vermont uh, Legal Aid Mental Health Law Project uh, shall become parties uh, uh, to these cases. Uh, again, uh, as uh, the Attorney General's Office for the Department of Mental Health and the Mental Health Law Project are the folks who really truly understand some of the ins and outs of uh, our mental health system, uh, the needs of individuals, and can speak to those needs uh, most appropriately uh, going through in, uh, in the court cases. Um, I can continue as long as, unless there are questions. Uh, well, currently the department's not a party? Currently the department is not a party uh, in criminal cases, and part of the issue is that uh, at times, uh, there may be uh, questions as to uh, once a decision of competency or sanity has been determined, uh, the next step in the process is to go to a hospitalization hearing where they determine whether a person should be ordered hospitalized or placed on maybe an order of non-hospitalization. Uh, and it happens that uh, at times the department is notified of an order of hospitalization that we were not party to or not aware of. Uh, and there are times that, uh, uh, and significant times, where we've had some strong disagreements with uh, the, the court's decision in that, and had no ability to uh, to express that those concerns or the, the clinical concerns that might indicate that a person was actually not appropriate for hospitalization, uh, and especially in light of limited resources in psychiatric uh, inpatient facilities, we're looking to ensure that the folks who are uh, ordered to an inpatient uh, facility truly actually need to be uh, in an inpatient psychiatric facility. Uh. Morgan, I'm looking at the bottom of page two, top of page three. Yes, sir. <clears throat> if I go before a judge and I have a client who we are questioning whether they were sane at the time of the event, but there's nothing about my relationship with that individual that leads me to say, Judge, I don't think this person is competent. I would only be asking for a sanity evaluation. This language specifically says that the examination of sanity shall only be undertaken if the person is determined to be competent first. Why do we want to go through the expense and the time of a competency evaluation if that issue hasn't been raised? I don't think it was our intent that to, to have language that, that uh, one would have to go through a competency evaluation. Um, I think our intent uh, with the language was that the, the evaluator had no, no questions about it. There was no questions, so they would just continue on with their with the sanity piece. Um, yeah, it's possible maybe we can make some it is you know, odd wording language say, changes. Is able to form the opinion. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it presumes that he's conducting an evaluation of competence. And the way this is designed, that issue would have to be a separate court hearing. Right. from the actual target, which is the sanity evaluation. Right. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Yeah, it was. Just the way that comes out, that could be a problem. Yep. Uh, maybe Karen could. Sorry, sure. yeah, if I may. Uh, Karen Barber, General Counsel for the Department. Actually, if you look up at the top of page two, um, it talks about examinations um, shall have reference to one or both. So it does talk about how you could only have a sanity or only have a competency, if that's the only issue. And then if you look at the section I think you're talking about, it is talking about if the psychologist or psychiatrist has been asked to provide opinions on both. And so I think that's when that would play in, um, come into effect. But the, um, the statute does actually talk about only being um, able to order one of them if that's, what, if that's what's being requested. So we do think the language covers it, but certainly we can continue to work with Ledge Council if you have concerns. So, if I'm understanding it right, then maybe a tweak, which may address Senator Bain's point, is that <coughs> line 17, page 2, 
uh, if the psychiatrist or psychologist has been asked to provide an opinion as to both, right, as to both the person's competency and the person's sanity, and then you could say at the beginning of the second sentence, uh, line 20, page 2, in such cases, the examination of the defense sanity shall only be undertaken. Mm -hmm. Is that right? So that, that links them yeah. up. So that, mm -hmm. that way, there wouldn't be the situation that's in our bank, I think. Yeah, yeah that does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we'd be good with that as well. But it still makes it two separate. You first determine whether a person is competent. If there's a question for that. If there's a question yes. about that, and then whether or not they're insane. Yes. It seems to make sense. To me. We can, we'll hear from other witnesses that it might not. And Pepper, you can jump. You kind of came late to the party, but you know, you feel free to jump in here. I know you and and uh, Morning Warp on this. Right. Yeah. I missed the sorry, James Pepper, Department of State Attorney's Sheriff's. I missed the question, but if the <coughs> question. Bottom of page two. There'll be a slight change. And they say the only thing I'm saying is I said that the psychologist is able to form the opinion that the defendant's competent to stand trial. The issue is if I have a client who I am interacting with and I have no indication that this person is in <coughs> I wouldn't ask for a competency evaluation. But if there's a question about what their brain was like at the time of the event, I would be asking for a sanity evaluation. I don't understand why you would even give the impression that a competency evaluation should take place first right. in a separate court proceeding before you can get to the actual target of what the problem is. And that was our exact concern with that provision as well. It sounds like we would be supportive of the change. Yeah. <laughs> so some of the other language uh, that, that we had worked on that we had asked to add in uh, is actually later on in the bill, uh, part of the uh, forensic study uh, piece uh, where it talks about uh, uh, that part of the study would, would look at uh, um, different models such as the Psychiatric Security Review Boards. Uh, and we also added in language also to study uh, 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 guilty but mentally ill verdicts in, in criminal cases, uh, as those seem to have kind of risen to the top of uh, some of the discussions uh, around how some of this, from a mental health perspective, can address some of the, the concerns that uh, this bill originally sought to address. And so. Uh, we want to make sure and, and really do, you know, again, this is something that uh, when the Department of Mental Health says we'd like to study, uh, folks should sit up and take notice because we get asked to do a lot of studies and a lot of times and kind of get weary of studies. Uh, but we feel that this is an extremely important topic that we want to be uh, judicious about and careful about. Uh, and uh, my understanding from talking with other national experts uh, who, who have worked with other states around this topic uh, that uh, it's all too easy to have unintended consequences uh, in relation to the setup of things like the Psychiatric Security Review Board or adding uh, criminal verdicts of guilty but mentally ill, things of that sort. And so we wish to be able to study that. As part of that study, uh, it was uh, mentioned in my testimony uh, last week uh, that the department would uh, uh, suggest uh, the addition of having a uh, an, an external uh, expert uh, slash consultant uh, be a part of the study, uh, and <coughs> the department would also ask that uh, uh, that some uh, funds be attached uh, or requested uh, to be able to do that, so that we could have an expert come in to help us, someone who is, uh, has national standards, uh, a national perspective, has worked with other states in, in these types of issues, uh, so that we're not just having our own internal conversations, but that we actually have um, outside folks who have some expertise in this area that can help help guide some of those conversations. Are It's possible I'd have to look into that. I can't. I don't mind putting in appropriation. It's unusual for the, the administration would support an additional appropriation. It would be difficult for us to have a uh, I think a robust study um, if we did not include uh, outside experts and I Can failed I, to see how to do that. Another question, and maybe, uh, maybe I'm missing it, trying to go through this quickly. Uh, yep. Where's the victim's piece? There's a notification. Yep. Page five. All right, I just lost into the study. 
Thank you. Yeah. And we didn't make any, <coughs> there was no real substantive changes to that other than uh, what uh, uh, Mr. Pepper from the state's attorneys had uh, suggested last time, which was the addition of the uh, uh, incompetent to stand trial. Oh, okay, uh, yeah. all uh, right. Yes, yeah. well. the victim gets notified by the state's attorney if they so desire. Correct, and then this also uh, put in uh, uh, the attorney generals if they happen to be uh, the one prosecuting the case, as uh, Mr. Shear brought up uh, in last week's testimony as well. Um, James Pepper again, Department of State Attorneys and Sheriffs. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we added, we asked specifically for <coughs> Section Five, which is on page six. That's the quote unquote Shero fix that allowed that permits this a state retained expert to examine um, a defendant for competency. Um, again, this would put these competency examinations on the exact same footing as the insanity evaluations, where the state can seek their own expert to evaluate a defendant. Um, we think that this is the most appropriate way to place to ch make the change. Um, we consulted with the Attorney General's office and we're in agreement that this just adds a section to the kind of discovery rules that allow, um, where it's a section right after the insanity evaluations, add one for competency evaluations. Other than that, um, you know, we, we looked at the, um, some of the additions from the Department of Mental Health about adding party standing. We don't have any serious concerns about it at this time. We got them last night, and I just want to just reach out to a few more people. I know that the bill has a possible vote tomorrow, but um, I don't see. If somebody's found incompetent to stand trial, <coughs> what happens? Do they get competent enough to stand trial at some point? That's Presumably. Mm -hmm. That's, that would be the intent and part of the study looks at uh, helping Vermont create a, uh, a competency restoration program. Uh, as it stands right now, there is no legislative mandate to restore someone to competency. And so current practice is it's random, uh, to, you know, someone's uh, mental health treatment uh, and they no longer may require, say, inpatient level of care. It doesn't necessarily equal that they're now competent. And so, you know, we, we have that struggle. And I'm generally more familiar with the insanity plea than the, 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 that they lack confidence to stand trial. I mean, usually until uh, the state's attorney in Chittenden County dropped those charge, those cases, mm -hmm. I think the competency uh, issue was really raised very often in here. It's usually been the insanity plea. Yeah. And in dip various cases, it, it, can, it can vary, uh, but in those cases in particular, you're correct. Um, so, I'm sorry you're kind of caught off guard here. Did you, did you and Moni want to testify together, or do you want to have anything to add? Or I, you know, this, this bill I think is a very good bill. Uh, I think that it, you know, the study committee in particular addresses all of the areas that the original bill was trying to address, but maybe in an insufficient or potentially unconstitutional way. Um, and so we're very much supportive of the kind of forensic study group, and we're, we hope that um, you know, we can come back with a polished product for this committee to look at, or the committee next door. Um, and with respect to the kind of other pieces of this, the victim notification, I mean, that's something that can happen immediately, and I, you know, in many cases should be happening you know, by our perspective. And honestly, under the kind of, some of the other provisions of the law, it seems like it should have been happening, but then it got interpreted differently um, by the Supreme Court. So I think that that is an incredibly important piece of this. Um, so I don't have much to add. I think this is- that section effective on I look to the yeah. mental health just because they're the ones who would be notifying us to see if they could well, do it. In terms you know. of hearing from Jack McCullough or Matt Valerio, put that out there. So at least they're aware of that. I mean, I'd have to check, but my current thought is I don't see what the barrier to that would be from our perspective. Um, it is limited to the 
Big 12 crimes. Well, uh, no, no, yeah, it's, 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 yeah. I mean, uh, not to show that most people are working. Right, of course. Uh, that, that's obviously the... the uh, obviously, uh, any crime is a right. serious thing if there's a victim. Any crime is serious. <laughs> any crime is serious. Crimes where there are victims <coughs> identified are that much more serious and victims need to be taken. <laughs> We've been caught on saying worse things than that. Well, I know, but I'm afraid that, you know, my opponent, <laughs> we have an opponent who's running for Vermont Senate and Governor. He's running on a Republican ticket. Running for both? Mm -hmm. He's a huge voter. <coughs> he's also he's very outspoken about the amount of huge voter fraud and benefits. Is this the guy election. with the dog on, the, on his thing? He's one of yours. Yeah, but I have no idea who you're talking about. Mr. Hoyt, you'll become familiar with him when you have your... Now I know who you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, great. I thank you all for working on this. Uh, David Scher, do you have any comments? Um, a few that are more in the, in the technical nature. Uh, if the committee wants to hear that now or some other time. No. Yeah, sure. All right. I mean, you're scheduled. Sounds good. Thanks. Yes, Lucy. Can I make Bring a comment after at some point? We can put you in. Okay, great. Thank if you. we have time. Okay. Today, tomorrow, Chris, you would also have Yes, to if you have time. We'll have time today and tomorrow for all of you. Mine is very short. So. Well, we're hopeful of that. <laughs> <laughs> We know you. We know you. And we're happy to hear from you. Good morning, I'm David here with the Attorney General's Office. Thanks for having me this morning. We uh, tried to do a very rapid review of this bill. I apologize, we didn't have a lot of time, but we, I had our criminal division look at it, and there were just a few things that they were uh, wanting to bring up. Some of them are actually current law issues, but they spotted in here, which, again. In those places where it mentions only state's attorneys, they would appreciate having the Attorney General's office mentioned as well, since the AGO is often a uh, party in some of these cases, often a party in these cases. So, for example, on page two, uh, line 15, um, state's attorney without AGO is, is there. Um, moving on from that. One question that the criminal division had, and I, I apologize that I wasn't here for deputy, the deputy commissioner's testimony earlier. On the top of page four, I understand uh, Attorney McCullough is here too and may be able to answer this. They were, the criminal division was, our criminal division was wondering a little bit about the purpose of the Vermont Legal Aid Mental Health Law Project having party status at a hearing where the defendant would would presumably be represented by counsel. Understanding, of course, that they do represent folks in civil peer commitment hearings and just wondering what the uh, policy rationale was there. Um, our criminal division's view of that was that um, it's, you know, makes sense to have the commissioner of mental health there, but with somebody who is currently represented um, by defense counsel, uh, and now also with the Commissioner of Mental Health coming in with the clinical side of things, what the sort of policy rationale behind this, what would seem to be giving defendant a second um, sort of counsel, this time employed by legal aid, and just trying to understand where that was coming from and what uh, policy end that was serving, again, given the context of this being a criminal uh, proceeding with uh, counsel already present. And uh, I assume that folks here in the room will be able to help us out with that. Um, the final thing that I'll bring up here was at the, actually near the end in the report section, there is on page, on page eight, there's a chunk that says the working group, and this is um, lines 13 through 17. 
working group, it instructs the working group to do a sort of large survey, which is entirely appropriate. We are very much in favor of that. Um, but we were also, the division, our criminal division was also curious then if you skip ahead to page nine, the bottom of page nine, lines 19 to 21, there's a very specific directive about the Connecticut um, system. <clears throat> and it's not to say we take any position on that, whether Connecticut is good or bad, but we're just, it seemed a little bit unclear to have a sort of, let's do a broad survey, entirely appropriate, and then a seemingly specific directive to look at Connecticut. It may be that that's where we want to go. There's, again, no opposition. Well, it was a, quite but, a bit of testimony regarding how good Connecticut's model was, and so we wanted to make sure that that was reviewed. And that's totally and fine. We could be put in that frame of reference that, you know, we had some testimony about it. That's why it's there. But can I, I, I had, I didn't catch that before, but this very specifically says there will be legislation adapting that model. It doesn't say to study it and to look at it. It says there will be legislation, proposed legislation to adapt that, adopt that model. Yeah, I don't think we need to do that. Yeah, it should be over here in the study. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's in the study also. Yeah, but, but it should, you don't want it there, that's what you're saying. Yeah, it shouldn't be there like that. You don't want it to say shall adopt it. Well, it's presuming the outcome of the study before yeah. the study is done. Right. 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 Well, why would you even say anything? Yeah, just don't. <laughs> if you were going to say something, maybe. But if you were going to say something, well, maybe. Well, you could say right? they shall study other states, including right. the Connecticut. Right. 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 In the study that itself, over here. Yeah. I marked. Yeah, yeah. But not presuming that you come to a conclusion. So That's also, right. Yeah. Also part of that is proposed draft. Can you get yeah, that? Yeah, just take that sentence out. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would take that whole right. thing out. Yeah. Okay. You Thank you, I didn't reason. catch that. Yeah. And the only final, sorry. Huh? Did you want to take out the requirement to propose draft legislation altogether? I wanted to take out that whole, the, the report shall connection. I think they should propose draft legislation regarding changes. Right, but not that, that particular. I just wanted to be clear. Oh. The whole yeah, thing. no, they can propose legislation if they want to. And the only final anyway. piece I'd mention is Attorney Pepper already testified to the uh, competency hearing piece, and we are uh, in agreement there and happy to answer any questions with anything else or that in the bill. Well, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, are you ready? Sure. Matt Valerio. Defender General. Um, took a look at this, had some questions as much as anything. Um, I wish I had my glasses as much as anything. Um, you got mine? What the hell did I say? Readers? Is that what you need? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I left them in my other coat. Wait, my hair's still somewhere back here. Oh, that Thank you. Do not like those. Threes or fours no, or something, are they right? Okay. They're twos. Do they work? Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> How do you get around? Would <laughs> 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 you like to try a different yeah. pair? <laughs> no, I, I just, I'll figure it out at some point here. Um, you know, the biggest questions that we had about this had to do with bringing in, you use the word parties a lot in this, and you, you talk about the, we have a criminal matter pending, and probably somebody's already gone through this, or at least looked at this issue, and usually the parties are the state and the defendant. And I just didn't know if, you know, if the commissioner of mental health was also gonna be a criminal defendant party or maybe the 
maybe legal aid also. What is party? What do you mean by parties in in this? Is it you know the, what does party status mean when it when you're talking about I'm gonna ask mental the health in a, in a criminal case? Or the state's attorneys to respond to that question. They might be interested parties in some way and have a legal position to put forward, but I don't think that they rise to the level of parties in a criminal matter. Um, it confuses me. I just don't know what that what that means. What rights do you get? So. Well, this this actually came from the Department of Mental Health. So. <laughs> so I think uh, the Department of Mental Health's concern is that there are times when with when competency or sanity are raised, it's being contemplated in putting someone into the commissioner's custody. And so therefore, we do have an interest. And we have before, um, in several cases, maybe disagreed with what has happened. You know, they're, they're making decisions to put people in our custody without, without getting our opinion, our clinical opinion on it. And so what the department is really seeking is to be at the table to get the reports, to have the opportunity to present to the court our concerns or our recommendations. I think however you want to phrase that, I think that's what we're getting at, is that we would like to be at the table, and we would like our clinical rationale uh, to be heard by the judge and be considered in the case when thinking about committing someone into our custody. There's some other terminology other than party status open to that. To me, they sound like witnesses, almost. I mean, if they're going to be presenting a clinical opinion that is contrary to, then they should be subject to cross-examination and uh, examination under oath, just like any other witness, if they have a um, if they have a position that's based. I'm asked, I kind of asked the same question. I I understand what their role is after the criminal case is over, and that doesn't doesn't bother me. And I actually we've talked over the years about um, when we get to the point of the hospitalization or non-hospitalization <coughs> hearing. We've spoken before about having uh, the legal aid uh, legal aid pick up the case at that point. They um, do more work with the Department of Mental Health as far as the therapeutic end than the Defender General's office does, and you know they have, they have more expertise in that. I mean, there's individuals within the DG's office who are as good as anybody, but I can't guarantee that. You know, any attorney representing anybody all over the state who might have a mental health uh, so defense what is or case. The Department of Children and Families' role in cases, for example, of where you're determining whether to place a child in custody, how does that work? Is there, aren't they a party to that or not? Well, the state is the party. It's not DCF versus. But DCF is there. Yeah, and they and they put social workers or people on the stand, and you can cross-examine them and ask them questions and test their opinion as to why they're uh, recommending what they're recommending. Um, you know, the state is the party that they are. I don't think they're parties. They're, they're just they're witnesses. Um, you know, party status to me raises other issues. Um, and, and I actually don't know how it would even how it would even work. Um, did this I have a lot, I have questions about this more than I had various issues, when you were early on in the proceeding, it's the, the beginning of the bill, does this, on page two, and I had a note on beginning on page three, are you, is this proposing that in every case where there's a mental health uh, issue, that competency and sanity evaluations be done Immediately at the same time. Okay, because it. You describe that. Yeah. 
Um, it, it read it read that way to me, and they're really they're, very well, distinct. Well, Joe, uh, Senator Benning brought it up, and nice to see you both on the same page. But. And we didn't even talk to each other. I was with Pepper, too. I, yeah. We were all in agreement. I, I the Eric will explain the change. It's a sequencing of uh, when the competency and the insanity evaluations take place, in particular cases, and that was uh, not as clear in the drafting. So the, if you... I don't know if you have a pen or want to add this, but the way the change, proposed change to it is, so you're on the bottom of page two, line 17. Yeah, right. So it, it only would apply in situations where, so if you read it, if the psychiatrist or psycholo psychologist has been asked to provide opinions as to both, both the, the person's competency and sanity at the time of the event. So in situations where they've been asked to provide opinions as to both, um, then the sequencing kicks in. So then the opinion shall be presented in separate reports and addressed separately, and then to start the second sentence by saying, in such cases, the examination of the sanity shall be undertaken if the competency formulation is done. So when they're asked to do both, um, the, they're separate, and um, that's the sequence that they go. That's the idea. What, what is the purpose of that? You need to ask the department that. I, the purpose around separating uh, the competency and sanity evaluations, is that well, it sounded like you're almost combining them as opposed to separating them. The, the language See, that uh, Vice Council mentions uh, should, be, should be basically saying that when the court orders both competency and sanity, the competency evaluation shall take place first before we would do an evaluation for sanity. In cases where just competency or just sanity is ordered, we will do just competency or just sanity. And the idea is that if you're found not competent, that you don't do the sanity exam until you've been found competent. Right. Um, just so that everybody's aware, you can raise their, you have a period of time to raise sanity. Um, you don't have to do that immediately at the very beginning of the case. Um, sanity is a defense that can be raised only with the consent of the defendant assuming that he's competent to stand trial, or she. And um, so sometimes what it takes is the gathering of information that you don't have at the very beginning of the case. So just so that you're aware, the timing of, of this, it, it's not neat like this. And the way some of the clients uh, um, address these issues, because you, you might be competent, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're well. Um, and making a decision about whether or not you want to raise a sanity defense can sometimes come and go. Um, and um, if you want to tie it with a bow early on in a, in a, in a kind of easy procedure, um, that's probably not going to work. Uh, but I can see, you know, if there are enough if, if, ifs, if this happens, then this happens, if this happens, then this. That's fine, but that's not often the way that it happens. Um, I had already talked about before the, the notice issue regarding uh, uh, victims, and we have no no problem with that. Now we see it in a draft, and it's we're fine. Um, I I'm running this by our appellate division. They between last night and this morning, I haven't seen any of them. Um, but if you go to page, uh, page six and seven, and particularly page seven involving um, treating a sanity examination like a non-testimonial order, it's in that kind of same section. Uh, medical inspections, handwriting samples, blah, 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 rule 16.1. Um, I think that there might be constitutional 
prohibitions have been against compelling somebody to have a uh, sanity evaluation um, or, or in order. I, I mean, I actually think they have a constitutional right to refuse to be examined um, if they decide that that's what they want to do. Um, and I know that this, this may arise out of some cases that have occurred in the last couple of years um, where the state was seeking evaluations of the defendant in cases where mental health issues were raised, um, but there was no authority uh, to do that. Um, but I think the reason there is no authority to do that is you probably have Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights um, not to, that you don't have to participate in those um, evaluations. So I don't know, you, you, I don't think you can statutorily overcome not those. Well, not the part that's not on page seven that's underlined in yellow and. Well, it's similar to what's on the bottom of page six. I think the existing law permits the ordering of uh, insanity when, per, when the defendant raises insanity as a defense, they can order the examination. So the proposal is to allow it for competency as well. Allows it to what? Competency. <laughs> Hi. Uh, these students are from Mount Anthony, well, Senate Judiciary. Welcome to Senate Judiciary. Thanks for being here. He is the chair of Senate Judiciary, so Good I hope you have a great time. Thank you. And, and um, I hope you get a picture with you later. Climb up on I hope so, too, but <laughs> yeah, we need to. Excuse me. Um, unfortunately, we have a crowded room here. Welcome. Uh, That's all right. That's not going to go anywhere. I mean, wait for it. I'm Dick Sears, chair of the committee. We're talking about the, about insanity pleas and uh, when people are deemed to be not guilty by reason of insanity or are not competent to stand trial and changes that might be made in that particular law. So, well, I see you. What do we got here? Winona Knapp. Oh, and Dominique Peace. Welcome. Any guys go to school there? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, no. Some of them are, you know, they're all, they're, you know. Same thing happens with Mike. School goes somewhere. All the girls go, none of the guys show up. <laughs> oh, my, my male students are in another <coughs> committee meeting. I do have males here, though. Oh, well, good. Yes. <laughs> Where are they? They're, I don't know what committee they're in. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I, what I'd like to do well, is get... we're lucky to have you four. And five. And five. With each. You're the, a teacher at... Yes, I am. Okay. On this, on this, this is the Defender General, so... You ever hear of I hope you never need me. <laughs> <laughs> but if you do, it's all right. Um, I'd like to get back to you on the cost this constitutional issue. I, I wanted to run it by, I, like I said, I just, I sent it over to Appellate and, you know, I... Well, we're going to take it up tomorrow. I, I think I'll have something for you by then. Okay. Um, the, uh, and I actually, I noted the same things regarding sort of the directive language on Connecticut. I don't know what's so special about Connecticut. <coughs> the world oh, you were here? Yeah, I was here. I saw that. But um, okay. the, what, I do, what I do know about Connecticut is they're good every five to ten years um, where they create great systems. And then by year seven, they don't fund them, and then there's a lawsuit. And then they get a whole ton of money, and then it's great again for another three to five years, and then they don't fund it, and then there's another lawsuit. Um, it can be true about the law. Well, you know, we try to get along here, you know. <laughs> um, that's what I have. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thanks for the glasses, Lucy. That puts you up next. <laughs> Lucy Garland from representing... I I did want to say that if, in the event that legal aid does want to, if somebody is declared um, incompetent or insane at the time, 
and we get to the hospitalization uh, hearing, if legal aid, and we've talked about this before, if they want to pick up the representation at that time for purposes of the hospitalization hearing, uh, I've said it before and I'll say it here just so we're clear, I, I don't, we don't object to that. So Jack will be testifying tomorrow. So, Lucy Garen DRM, I will be very short. Um, on page eight with the work group, we're hoping to add a representative of the designated hospitals to the work group appointed by VAS. By who? The Hospital Association. Oh. So, there are five designated hospitals in the state. Um, so, we just would like a seat at the table. No. Um, UVM Medical Center, CVMC. The retreat, Springfield. Um, so, well, they have the Wyndham Center. Well, but not the Wyndham Center. Not anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. Oh, they're not bankrupt anymore. Well, no, they may be bankrupt, but they're not a designated <laughs> hospital. I think oh, oh, Morning so can tell you. Wyndham Center no longer. As of January one. Oh, as of January one. Okay. So it doesn't exist at all, or did somebody it, take it, it over? Exists, the Wyndham Center still exists. They're still, they're still taking. Uh, psychiatric patients just voluntary in nature. Yeah, not they, involuntary. they voluntarily chose as of January 1 not to seek redesignation while they're going through their kind of whole process with Springfield Hospital. It's possible in the future that may change, but right now they're not currently designated for involuntary psychiatric patients. But they're still under the auspices of Springfield Hospital? Yes. yes. Okay. The VA hospital yeah. is also designated. Oh, the VA, yes. Could you repeat yeah. the language, Lucia? Uh, so a representative of designated hospitals appointed by the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you. Hello. Okay. Mm -hmm. Chris Bell represents the victims of the crime. And I too will be very short. <laughs> Why well, just so all of you from the audience know that you also have representatives if you should become a victim of a crime. Thank you, Senator Sears. Chris Fenno from the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services. Um, the o only question I had, and Pepper may actually have an answer for this, is that there, I, I would like the state's attorneys in the AG's office to have a, a policy and procedure around notifying victims. And I would suggest that rather than opting in, that they opt out. So that it's incumbent on somebody to try to notify the victim um, if they have not opted out of notification. Maybe actually, you know, I dealt Saturday morning with a family member of the victim of murder. The, the, murder, the murderer escaped from Carrillo and uh, uh, Bellows Falls. And uh, he uh, murdered man from Bennington in 1987 and his brother still lives in Shaftesbury and wasn't notified that the guy had absconded and it's like the, it's, it's a long story of furlough failures but to make a long story short the, the fact is that they evidently had been confused about signing up for the <coughs> victim notification and so they weren't um, the the victim's wife was notified, but the brother wasn't. Mm -hmm. There's this kind of confusion about that. So it might be, mm -hmm. I, I think that's probably a good idea. Um, and I will say this for your state's attorney, she's more than willing to help get him signed up. I call mm -hmm. Tracy about it, because um, it happened in Bellows mm -hmm. Falls. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, so I think that's- They picked him up. Uh, so they got him this morning about, up, yeah. I got an email Where? from no. Rutland. Got him. Good. So that's my only recommendation is an opt out rather than an opt in. Because then I think it will give it some importance. Things just, you know, years later. And I just think that every attempt should be made uh, to notify victims. If they want to. If, well. I can see. <laughs> if they I don't have a long conversation 
I mean, this this guy had a number. We also talked about expunging his record, so it was more than just you know. But in talking with him, he said every time this happens and we hear about it, that's re-victimizing us. Mm -hmm. we, we then get reminded of all that. So there may be victims who don't wish to be notified. And then right. They would and then they would opt out. Right. Um, and we actually, we were talking about this in the office, and we have two long-time employees who actually victims call them. They, they were so sort of paranoid that they didn't even want to sign up for the victim notification uh, automatic one. Um, but, you know, 15 years later, they're still checking in um, with our staff because they're worried that people are going to get out. Okay, any That's questions? Okay, any okay. questions? <coughs> adding that Yep. All right. Um, you've got some extra time. But are you ready today, Jack, or do you want to wait till tomorrow? I was going to talk to Karen Barber about one of the things, so it might be better for you to wait till tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Judge Grishin, if you're ready, sure. we can. I never thought we'd get to you today. Okay. Neither did I. <laughs> but thank Amen. you for being here. Amen. Good morning. For the record, Brian Grierson, uh, Chief Superior Judge, speaking to revised uh, draft 4.1, uh, 183. Um, Section one, I'm looking at uh, the line, uh, line 16. Commissioner shall be a party when issues of competency or sanity are raised. Um, I had a chance to at least get this out to the judges, a, a quick response, and in my view, and, and we've discussed this before in, in other committees, is that I think it's appropriate, not when the issue is raised, um, but once there has been a competency determination, if the individual is found to be uh, incompetent, the next step is the hospitalization, or I think you referred to it here as commitment, hearing regarding commitment. So it's a hospitalization or non-hospitalization hearing. And uh, there was a study commission, I want to say two, maybe two or three sessions ago, uh, involving all the folks that have been testifying here, and I, my recollection was that there was consensus that at that stage, at the hospitalization uh, hearing or non-hospitalization hearing, that it made sense to then bring in the Department of Mental Health uh, as a party, as well as uh, legal aid. And the primary thinking, at least my recollection, was that at the competency stage, it's still clearly a question of public safety um, and, and criminal behavior. If you determine, if the determination is that the individual is incompetent to stand trial, then at least at that point the focus turns to not punishment, um, but uh, treatment. And I think both legal aid and the Department of Mental Health are better informed at that stage as to what it, what is necessary. I think um, the, the last Forget the bill number. I don't know if you found it, Eric, but um, that provision actually went through in a bill form through the House, and I believe it came here. I don't know that we ever had a hearing in, in front of Senate Judiciary, um, but it, it may be one way of resolving what I think was a concern by the state's attorneys uh, was to leave the state's attorney at the table at the hospitalization hearing, but still allow uh, DMH and the Attorney General's office to come in uh, and they could work together at that point, but I think it would be important to bring in uh, Jack McCullough and, and folks from his order. Those are the folks that, if it, once it's in the civil forum, they're the ones that are going to be involved anyway. So um, I agree with the concept, but I think it's later at a later stage that it would be appropriate. Um, under Section 2. Thank you, Judge. The stage where the bill does actually make DMH and legal aid a party is the top of page four. This is the, the commitment hearing stage. And if I'm hearing you right, you're saying that's the appropriate time for them to be a party. 
Yes. Um, yes. Both, as far both, as both. section one, I think you guys have to think about what that what that language might read. I think there was some concern expressed by the defender general about what the party's wording means in that context as well. So maybe that's a either keep it in that place or tweak it a little bit to I'm talk about glad notice and an opportunity to be heard, maybe, or, or, or something. Or strike it and just keep cool. it in the later piece on the top of page four. Most of the, that makes sense? Most of the issues of Eric is I'll be glad to talk with DMA track most of the issues. Thanks. Um, they clearly should be involved at that hospitalization hearing as parties. As to what notice, uh, it, it may be a matter of getting notice of the earlier proceedings and not necessarily party status. So that may be may be one way of resolving that. That's what Matt was saying to it. Yeah. Um, so section two. The current statute um, seems to require that the psychiatrist conduct every examination and that an examination by a psychologist be included when the defendant has a developmental disability. Feel free to take a seat. If you need to open up, feel free to take it, please. I think it's a matter really of clarifying um, is it just the psychologist or do they intend that a psychiatrist should be involved in every evaluation and then only bring in psychologists um, when there's a developmental disability? Wait, where is that on? Um, I'm in section two. Oh, on line seven? Yeah. And this is all, of course, this is the current law. Yeah. Um, so uh, one of the uh, judges just raised the question of does that mean that in every case there is a psychiatrist and only uh, bring in a psychologist um, when there are cases involving developmental disability or if it is a case identified as developmental disability psychiatrists still have to be involved and so I think it was more a matter of clarification than anything else and again I'll be glad to talk with the folks from DMH okay. on that and on section 3 uh, we have no uh, no comment it makes sense agree with section four that notice uh, should be required <coughs> when the person is discharged we have no objection to that and we have no comments on um, uh, section five I'm sorry again we have no uh, objection section five and have no comments with respect to section six or seven. Uh, one matter that's not uh, uh, part of the bill that has occurred, at least brought to my attention recently, when uh, individuals are found incompetent and we move to the next phase, other than in extremely serious uh, violent offenses, most of those cases are dismissed without prejudice at that stage and then they go to the civil process. We discovered recently that at least in one uh, county, and I don't know how widespread it is and I'm looking into it, that they have left those cases open um, without dismissing them, sometimes for 10 years or more, uh, which raises all kinds of questions about the conditions of release that may have been imposed mm -hmm long time ago and so the the thought was that there ought to be some consideration to um, when a case should be um, how long does the case stay open and if we're going to be talking about restoration services uh, you, you probably wouldn't want to dismiss it but the question is how long should a case remain open um, and so we would 
suggest the committee may want to consider that as they as they move forward. So we can take this up tomorrow, and then the plan would be to vote it out on Tuesday, mark up final mark up Tuesday, along with the robocall bill, which most people are. We have not yet heard from the robocall industry, but they don't want to testify. Tuesday, we, we should be ready to mark it up, and I hope that everybody will have any suggestions, and by then it gives you the whole weekend after tomorrow's testimony. And that's all I right. think this bill would go to health and welfare or Tuesday to look at it, and then maybe appropriations. If you, if you have language on that appropriation, to have an outside person. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Unless somebody else wants to testify on this bill, I think we're, we're going to take a, a lengthy break until 10.30. Ooh, so if everybody can be back, right? Yes, Mr. Mr. Um, Could I just make one brief comment? Absolutely, and stay right there. Okay. And um, Ed Paquin speaking yeah, for Disability people. Rights Vermont. Let the people at Mount Anthony know that you have a Bennington connection. <laughs> I have a Bennington connection? Heck. I was born there, grew up in Chasbury, graduated from Mount Anthony Union High School in the first class to actually go through four years there. So it's my old stomping grounds, as they say. You're like an original alumni. Oh, most affirmed. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, I would just make the comment in the section on studying forensic needs that the state's mental health care ombudsman ought to be included there, and that's the state's protection and advocacy system, which is disability rights for Vermont. Um, uh, I think nobody, is there any objection to having that? Thank you. Thanks for that advertisement from Mount Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll take a break till 10.30.